Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the next iteration of the NYU Tisch Sports Chalk Talk Series. I'm Dr. Daniel Kelly, the Academic Director for Graduate Programs. And joining me today is going to be Hans Seeger, uh, the Head of Business um, Development for BVB, for Russia Dorman and International Partnerships. Um, we're going to start off today's presentation diving into the topic, and then of course I'm going to jump over to Hans for his personal presentation as well as a deep dive into his subject matter. And so we'll start by sharing my screen and jumping into the presentation for today, which for me is an exciting topic. This is um, something I've been following for the past six, seven months. It is um, an amazing topic that dives into global sport leagues in the post COVID era. We're gonna dive into the efficiency and the effectiveness of the bubbles we're gonna talk about the different plans of actions for the return to play, and also what worked and what didn't work. And then so I'll focus more in this presentation, which will be about 20 minutes on the US side, and then we'll dive into the German Bundesliga with Hans and Borussia Dortmund and their experience and what he's had to deal with as far as uh, managing his job expectations and description in the global scene for soccer. And so starting off, this session will take a deep dive into the best practices for major sporting leagues. As I mentioned earlier, what worked and what didn't work. And we're trying to figure out exactly what was the right formula when it came to the return to play format for professional sport leagues. Before we get going though, I, I found an exciting study from the Arizona State Global Sport Institute. And it really broke down a lot of things that I felt were essential for this presentation for today. Out of the 1,800 adults who were surveyed, uh, 300 per, per U.S. region, uh, back in September, it shows a breakdown for the regions of responses of who wanted to return to major sporting events across the U.S. And if you look at it, even across the different regions, a lot of fans were not really interested in going to live sports. And so we're seeing, even now in Major League Baseball, with the return to play for the playoffs, and we're seeing that 10,700 fans are being allowed to go to the championship series games that a lot of fans are just not interested. And so what does that mean? As you look at the breakdowns, the age-wise, 18 to 34, 34 to 35 to 44, uh, 45 to, to 40, 54, 55 to 64, 65 plus, it seems that the younger generations are willing to take the risk during COVID, which is not surprising. And as they get older and wiser, you see the numbers are actually inversing and that a lot of the older citizens in the U.S. are not interested in the chance that it takes to go to a live sporting event. If you look at it also, male to female, the gender discrepancies are very different as well. And then, of course, since it is that time of year in the U.S., the political affiliation between Republicans and Democrats, who's interested in going to the games, is virtually a dead heat, 58% to 50%. And so what you're seeing here is that across the regions, across the, the country, the interest in going back to games in a live setting is different across many different platforms. And so fans returning to sporting events is not a, a no-brainer. You know, based on these numbers, this would probably change the marketing tactics for how you would get the fans into the stadiums. And so, you know, this kind of information is important because as we transition to a post COVID world, figuring out ways to safely reintegrate fans into the sporting realm, we have to figure out exactly who's going to come back to the games, who's interested, who's willing to take that risk. And so for the return to play plans for the different sporting leagues, uh, we're going to dive into the NBA, the NHL. Um, we're going to see some, some pretty cool stuff in the breakdowns for the different leagues and who did what and what worked and what didn't work. Um, Major League Baseball, which has been ever evolving. <laughs> MLS would have had a lot of success when they came back. Um, the National Women's Soccer League, the NFL. And so we're going to see all the different leagues. And so Starting off with the case study, uh, congratulations to the Los Angeles Lakers on their recent championship on Sunday. Um, that cost them $180 million for the NBA. Now that is a tremendous investment. Now, if you think about the NBA Orlando bubble, estimated cost of 180 million, let that number sink in. 
That's a return to play in a safe environment that is COVID free. Over 172 games were played in Orlando. The league went from July 12th and was all the way through to October 11th. And so you're talking about over three months of competition games and no positive COVID test throughout the entire experience. Now that was an enclosed system that, that allowed for them to, to maximize their grouping. And so the plan for COVID, the plan for the NBA bubble was to have a maximum of 1,600 people on the campus at any given time and travel parties were limited to 37 people per team. And so it was a really structured format, very dedicated format that dove into this system. From here, the NBA bubble, if you did decide to leave the bubble anytime, there were stringent rules such as being quarantined for 10 days, uh, players were not permitted to bring guests until after the first round of the playoffs, and the NBA established an anonymous hotline, which we heard about many players being called out or um, put on notice for violating a lot of the rules. And so what we saw was a publicized effort on how strict it was in the NBA bubble. And I think from my personal perspective, that's what led to its success. Now, additionally, if you see from these pictures, the NBA bubble, a very isolated area, you see players stretching in conference ballrooms. Um, throughout this process, all the players had to log into a smartphone application called the NBA My Health, which is a daily wellness questionnaire. This is a system that we use consistently here at NYU's campus as well. They also had a Kinza smart thermometer and a, a Massimo Mighty Stat Plus ox, oximeter, which checks your blood oxygen levels uh, with both devices transmitting the results to the app. And so the rules were so strict that if someone uh, registered a temperature of over 100 degrees Fahrenheit or symptoms such as loss of taste, loss of smell, or the oxygen levels increased to a, a downward trend over time, they were not allowed to, to continue in the system or in the bubble. And so having these types of rules, also with the ESPN Wild World of Sports, having aspect, aspects to a hospital facility near, near the campus, it allowed for them to have resources on board that made this type of endeavor doable. Uh, one of my favorite aspects of the Disney bubble, 25 different health checkpoints and the Disney magic band, which you see NBA player uh, Tyus Jones uh, checking in pretty much. And so this is how the NBA was able to keep track of their players throughout the bubble experience. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, $180 million for an enclosed bubble, 172 games, and we're talking about a little over three months. That's a tremendous investment. And what's missing is that a large number of revenue is not coming in right now because there's no fans. And so having this type of environment, this type of investment, the result was the Los Angeles Lakers winning the championship, but in the end, the NBA showed a proven battleground tested plan on what it takes to return to play. And so uh, the WNBA, not exactly a $180 million investment, which is sad because it, they're on par athletic wise when it comes to their competition and the high caliber of, of their athletes. And so they competed at the IMG Academy, which is in Bradenton, Florida, and a fantastic facility, a fantastic um, academy, yet they weren't given the same type of resource that the NBA was given. And it's, it's quite a shame because the WNBA is a comparable league and deserves the same treatment. And that just wasn't the case. But the Seattle Storm did come through with a championship. And, you know, I think that overall, they would say the experience was worth it but I kind of wish they would have gotten the same resources or at least comparable resources to the NBA. Um, moving forward, I wanted to dive into the NHL bubble case. Uh, this was a fantastic case for me. The NBA is my favorite case because it really shows the intricacies of the resources that were abound, but the NHL was a very creative case. So rather than having one single location, they used two locations. Uh, for the Western Conference teams to be in Edmonton, Canada, and for the Eastern Conference teams to be in, in Toronto. And I'm gonna break down the different aspects of both of those systems. And so for Edmonton, for the Western Conference teams, they almost like took over different parts of the city. So you'll see that there's a, a 900 person health testing area. 
There's four luxury hotels, 14 on-site diverse restaurants, bars, and pubs that are only for the players, eight movie theaters, 24 dedicated lounges and suites and office spaces, and 13 dedicated fitness centers, weight facilities, and practice ice rinks. And so even though they were integrated within Edmonton downtown, they also isolated themselves within the city. And so rather than being at a far off desolate location like the Disney or ESPN Wild World of Sports, they were integrated into the city's infrastructure in Edmonton. It's pretty creative and it's a, it's a unique idea. And we move forward, Toronto, the same setup. Uh, four interior premium clubs, uh, the BMO Center to have an outdoor facility, 14 on-site diverse restaurants, eight tennis courts, golf suites, media theaters, and fitness studios, 12 dedicated dressing and medical rooms, and four practice facilities used by the Eastern Conference teams. And so this setup is quite different than the NBA setup, but still quite effective and quite unique. Uh, MLB's return, um, Major League Baseball, safety guidelines for a three-pronged approach to minimize risk and exposure and limiting the spread. Um, recently, of course, through the um, National League bubbles and, and American League bubbles in, uh, in Texas as well as California, they're now selling tickets for those games, as you probably noticed from the games two days ago. Um, everyone over the age of two must wear a mask. Um, sanitation. Sanitization, of course, sinks are set up throughout the concourse to encourage frequent hand washing. And of course, um, as you can see from these two photos, when we have the earlier games in the playoffs, there were no uh, limited fans in the seats. And of course, we're seeing these, these pods. And so fans are allowed to come back in pods of fours to, to live action for sporting events. Um, and you're starting to see the, the difference for the games. And so uh, one thing I did want to point out is that Globe Life Stadium, which is where in Arlington, in preparation for the return of fans to baseball, they hosted 61 high school graduations this spring, and they used that as a test case for gaining valuable experience about ushering guests through their stadium amid the pandemic. And so I think that type of creativity shows that, you know, sport organizations are dynamic and they're also changing with the times to see exactly what it takes to survive during this time period. Um, to hold 61 different high school graduations is a testament to understanding the seriousness of COVID-19 and working to figure out a way for fans to return to the games. And so I think it was a no brainer that through that preparation that Globe Life is gonna be the host of the World Series this year. And so as the MLB exhausts all these different options and looking for bringing baseball back in a safe environment, uh, the World Series bubble at the at Globe Life Stadium in Arlington is gonna be fantastic. Uh, the National Women's Soccer League, uh, the Utah Challenger Cup. Uh, we had a couple of, one of our students actually was, um, was organizing that event from our MSN Global Sport Program. Um, this uh, month long Challenger Cup, uh, went from June 27th to July 26th. Um, that time period is, is fantastic because it shows you that it's before the return of the NBA, the return of the NHL. And so the, the National Women's Soccer League pretty much became the barometer for U.S. Uh, bringing sports back. And so over the course of the Challenger Cup, the Houston Dash won the championship. And, they, and that entire Challenger Cup event had over 2,000 tests of their athletes and had zero positive cases of COVID. And so I think it goes to show the effectiveness of having a contained area when it comes to COVID-19 and the impact this has on, you know, really bridging the gap between safety measures as well as what's important as you progress forward in the return to sports. Uh, Major League Soccer also had an MLS is back tournament, uh, July 8th to August 11th. Um, ESPN Wild World of Sports, uh, the Portland Timbers one. Uh, I picked a photo here, as you see, of the, of the players biding their time in a public space, but still adhering to COVID pr protocols and procedures. And so I think, um, you know, one of the most consistent trends you're seeing in the return to sports is there has to be buy-in from the players. You know, the, the players, the owners, the, the staff, the coaches, the administration, it has to be all hands on deck that believe in the mission of safety. 
that believe that in order for us to fulfill the dream of completing the season, that we all have to be healthy. I think you're seeing these trends happening in the different sport leagues. Um, some are, are being more aggressive than others. Some are bringing back fans quicker than others as well. And so I think, you know, they're all testing it and pushing the limits in different ways. But to see that the players are buying in, that the players are wearing the mask, the referees are wearing masks, the owners are wearing masks. I think it shows that COVID-19 is being taken seriously and, and safety and health precautions are also being taken seriously as well. Uh, the NFL's return. Um, this has been one of the hotly debated topics. Uh, training camps, uh, limiting the number of players that could um, be in the same facility at once. Um, also, the NFL and the NFLPA having to negotiate the impact on the salaries if the games are canceled. And of course, um, players can take a COVID-19 opt-out if the family member is sick. And so you see the pictures here. We have the referee with wearing the mask. We have NFL reigning MVP. Uh, Lamar Jackson wearing a mask as well. And so you're seeing that the NFL is, is taking it seriously. However, we're still getting recent COVID tests. You know, uh, players are, are, are actually contracting COVID and, you know, with the possibility of spreading it. Uh, most recently, Cam Newton from New England Patriots, you know, contracted it, as well as his teammate, Stephen Gilmore. And so you're seeing that these protocols, these options, you know, the NFL chose not to go to a bubble environment. And so I think, you know, it's not so much the players when they're in the facilities you have to worry about them. It's when they return home to the, to the outside of the bubble environments, you know, and, and how are they operating in, in, those, in those, those zones of their lives. And so I think, you know, it's the pressure to be able to still live a normal life, but still be able to compete in your sport in a safe environment. And just from my personal perspective, the bubble provides you with the safety precautions for both. Um, I did want to dive into the NFL viewership. Uh, normally during this time of year, the NFL is the lone ranger when it comes to sports. Uh, basketball is done back in June. Um, Major League Baseball usually ends in October. And so during this time period, the NFL has had to share the airwaves, share, share the, the, the media space. And so... As you see from the networks through week four, aside from Fox, which is holding on very strongly during the pandemic, NBC numbers are down, CBS numbers are down from a year from today to a year ago, and ESPN numbers are down as well. And so um, the rationale for that, the advertising, just the, the wonder of what can the NFL do with that large market share. And so if you look at it, it's still 18 million people are viewing into NFL games, which is a fantastic number. And so when you look at it on NBC for those Sunday night games, 18 million people is a great number, but that's 2,000 less than a year ago. And so it makes, sorry, 2 million less than a year ago. So it makes you wonder, what are those 2 million people doing on Sunday that this year that they weren't doing last year? All right. Are they watching... Major League Baseball? Are they watching the NBA Finals? Are they just not tuning into sports because they can't go to the games? And so I think, you know, figuring out those types of, of questions, figuring out those types of answers is the next steps. All right. And so at this time, um, one of my, my favorite colleagues, um, Hans Seeger, as I mentioned earlier, is going to join us right now. And um, as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions for Hans, or myself about the return of sports to play, uh, please put them in the Q&A feature or the chat feature. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly. Um, it's definitely a pleasure, um, and thank you for having me. And it's great to see some familiar names here dialing in as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm excited to share a little bit of what I do, um, how, how I got to the position where I am currently, and... Um, Yes, Dr. Kelly mentioned, feel free to shoot any questions and I'm more than happy to, to answer them at, at the end. Um, as of right now, I prepared uh, just a few slides that I would like to share with you. Um, just, um, yeah, again, a little bit of background um, where I'm coming from. Um, but you can see it now. Um, what I did at my previous job, what I do currently and um, the impact that COVID-19 had on, on my daily routines. So this is me with the sunglasses on the picture. 
and uh, with my brother. And I hope you can recognize the place. This is Washington Square um, in front of one of the NYU buildings, um, which I visited. I think this picture was taken place around four years ago when I um, went to Georgetown University and did my master's in sports industry management. And that's also where I got to know Dr. Kelly. Um, so after those two years in the US, I moved back to Europe and started working at Adidas in, in Amsterdam. Um, the headquarters is in Germany, but I, I, yeah, I worked uh, in the Netherlands. And then um, this year I moved to Dortmund and um, I'm currently working in the partnership department um, for the club where I look after all the international sponsors and partners. So um, what did I do at Adidas in the last uh, two years? Um, I, think, I think it makes sense to maybe say one or two sentences about the structure of Adidas because it's such a, a global brand that operates in, in every market um, to better understand the function of my team. Um, the way Adidas is, is structured is they are divided up in many vertical business units that are kind of almost operating as their own company. So you have your football business unit um, and that's do everything from producing the shoe, from marketing, from sales to PR, etc. Then you have your vertical business unit, um, US sports, originals, um, etc. So I was working in the horizontals team. So my team was making sure that all those business units tell the same story, that they are all under the umbrella of Adidas so that the customer recognizes that even a basketball player, the product tells the same story and spreads the same message as, a foot, as football does, for example. So um, on my daily routines, I was basically, I was um, asked from other units. So let's say the original uh, business unit came up to me and said, look, we have this new Stan Smith shoe coming out in two months and we need a global asset to promote it. Then um, my team and I, we were I think five, six, five people. We would uh, then identify global assets to make sure that we have the best um, possible and most authentic fit. Because obviously we need, um, the product needs, needs, to be, um, needs to fit to the asset. The customer needs to, needs to believe that um, the asset identifies with the products, tells the same story. So we would then um, approach the asset or the management of the asset um, and tell them what it's all about, brief them, give them all the information that they need. Um, and then going from there, when we have the confirmation um, that, they, that we can activate the asset, and then it's all about um, organizing, um, um, coordinating the, the activation. Um, and those activations can vary from, from as simple as a social media post as you can see here, Messi just you know, um, holding, holding a, um, the, the boots up to a TV commercial, to a campaign, to an actual physical event. So it was a lot about relationship management, talking to their manager, but also talking to all different parts of the company uh, in, within Adidas. Um, and then ultimately also um, talking to the asset directly, not in every case, but in, in many cases. So it was a mixture of, um, of, of communicating well, of, create, of creating content, that the asset understands it, that it's, it's believable, that it's authentic for, for the customer, and then ultimately um, coordinating the ultimate event. So I did that and then I moved um, to Dortmund. I hope most of you know the club. It's uh, the second biggest club in Germany, um, biggest uh, attendance um, in Germany. It's quite, famous for, yeah, I would say for its notorious fans. It has uh, the biggest standing area in the stadium in Europe. And I might, I don't want to lie, but I think even globally when it comes to football. So um, it's quite an impressive stadium. Who has ever been there uh, know what I'm talking about. And who hasn't been there should come here. So um, yeah, long story short, was it for me a no-brainer? I always loved the club. I, I, was, um, I grew up. Close, uh, close to the city. And there I started a position um, in the partnership management. And I'm um, looking after every sponsor and partner um, internationally of BVB. And those partners can, 
yeah, can vary. We have sport corporations, for example, a, a football club in Australia in the first league of Japan. But I'm also looking after um, a sponsor like Puma, who um, provides the jerseys and, and all the gear. We have global brands. Um, so depending on, on the, the partner, obviously, um, the, the rights uh, in those contracts uh, differ a lot and um, the volume of those rights um, differ a lot. And yeah, you have rights from, from a, a VIP box to PR appearances with players, meet and greets, uh, with social media posts, to um, banners on websites, on apps. So basically everything you can, you can think of, we, um, we kind of sell to, to the partners. Um, very popular among international sponsors is a, um, we call it an adrenaline trip. So we would, or the partner would come to Germany, we would show them the Youth Academy, which is quite famous. Um, we always have great talents. We show them the stadium, watch the game. After the game, have a, have a meet and greet with a player who just played. So we try to give the sponsor the best possible experiences um, in Dortmund. So my job is to activate those rights um, so everything that's in that contract, I need to deliver. And so you can imagine it's um, a lot about relationship management, again, um, similar to, to Adidas. Um, you constantly need to, need to talk to your partners. And usually, without COVID, this is my job. But because COVID uh, changed everything and changed the contracts, um, now it's compensation um, basically dominates my, my daily routines. And um, yeah, but compensating, I mean, we have no rights in the contract that we can't execute. Um, we can't allow all the fans um, to come to the stadium. We can't um, have PR appearances with players. We can't really um, have meet and greets, etc. So the challenge that I'm facing and my colleagues are facing with their sponsors now is to, to come up with new rights because ultimately we don't want to transfer money back and the partners, um, they, they, need, um, they need something for their money, right? So um, it's, it's, a diff it's a difficult time due to COVID. So right now, um, compensation again um, is, is quite omnipresent these days. And last but not least, it um, comes along with the right activations as um, coordinating events such as photo shootings, um, those trips of those partners when they come to come to Germany. So um, that's also a bigger component of my um, of my daily task. And last, um, yeah, the the impact that uh, that COVID nineteen has. Um, I already touched on it, and I I try to keep it short and simple. What I think is. Yeah, stood out to me most, what, what helped me the most these days um, is on one hand communication. Of course, you always need to be close to your partners, but these days um, I talk with them almost on a daily basis on the phone because you, you need to understand they are paying a lot of money for rights that we can't deliver. So they get a lot of pressure from their bosses as well. Some of them, their, their budget has been cut. So a lot of questions are raising, okay, why are we still sponsoring them if we can't get all the, um, all the rights? So what's very helpful these days and what I spent quite a lot of time um, and shouldn't be underestimated is know everything about your partner, your industry, how hard did COVID hit their business? Um, can we expect them to go bankrupt um, after COVID or hopefully if COVID is ever, ever over, um, can we expect their revenue to increase again? So it's very important to understand where your partner sits these days, um, or how their situation is. So always put yourself in their shoes, how, how desperate they are, or some, we also have sponsors that benefited from COVID. Um, so yeah, you need to know um, how their situation is. And what helped me a lot was the daily exchange with my colleagues, because as I mentioned, we need to, create new rights, new activities, new events that we sell to our sponsors in exchange of other rights that we can deliver. So um, now talking to our digital team um, is super helpful because we know what they're working on, on the app, on, 
um, websites or different tools and we might be able to utilize that and um, pitch this to our partners or talk to our social media guides to the BVB TV team can we come up with new formats um, can we shoot content with our players and um, share it on social media to increase um, or to maximize the reach so those are things that are vital these days next I would say um, staying flexible when it comes to the contract. Usually, I mean, nobody has been in this situation before. A sponsor in the beginning of the season has their contract, they pay for their rights and they are delivered. Now um, everything has changed. So you need to be flexible. You constantly need to develop new, most, mostly digital rights. So, um, and when you come up with rights and the partner's interested in it, it's super important to put a monetary value behind this. And sometimes it's super difficult um, because we never had those rights. It's hard to prove. And um, sometimes it's obviously hard to, to argue with your partner um, to tell them why we think this is worth um, X amount of money. And at the end of the day, um, it's, uh, we, need, we have to negotiate quite a lot and this is, also very new to me um, before this job. I never had to really negotiate, especially with those sums of, uh, of money. Um, but yeah, when you, when you constantly have to do it, you, you learn from it and you try to get your, your technique and um, how to do it. So that's something that also kind of dominates these days, um, my, my weeks. Um, and I think last but not least, this is a sentence that I, I got from the US when I did my master's um, at Georgetown. Some uh, professor told me, I see change as an opportunity. And I think this is very true these days because um, we are, or COVID forced us to, to think new ways, to think of new activities, new events that we never thought of. So although we would have loved obviously to, to stick to our rights and to just fulfill them, we now need to we need to think in another direction. So we need to get out of our comfort zone. We are used to, and also our partners are used to the same rights in some cases in the last five or 10 years. But now that everything changes, um, it is an opportunity. And because we did come up with many rights, new rights, um, our portfolio of, um, of those rights has, yeah, I would say dramatically increased, which, which is great for, for next year to, to sell to potential new partners, but also to our existing partners. Yeah, I think this is this is it. I hope this gave a good understanding of what I did, how how I got here at um, BVB, and what I currently do, and um, what challenges COVID brought to my to my daily tasks. So I would stop sharing my screen now, and um, yeah, maybe Dr. Kelly, you you have some questions, or should we open up directly? Yeah, I think right now it's, it's pretty exciting. The, we have a lot of questions in the Q&A and the chat feature. So uh, we're going to start with um, a question from one of our students in the Masters in uh, Global Sport Program, Caroline Casper. Um, how do you foresee brand sponsors and partners pivoting and finding new ways to engage with fans when they cannot be in the arena? Um. Yeah, as, as I mentioned, we, we think a lot about digital events. We have, um, especially in Asia, where our fans are very tech savvy. We have basically around every match now, kind of a, a digital fan viewing party where we have, let's say, a legend come as a Q&A before the game. We have kind of a show, a pre-show where we produce tailor-made content for our Japanese fans, for example. And then our sponsors, um, are integrated in those fan viewing parties and they can um, they can be visible to to our fans there so their logos their their brands their their spots are um, yeah are visible to to our fans in that audience so we try to make yeah tailor made content for those partners in in the markets that are that are important for them um, I think another technique that's quite helpful for us and that not only one other club is doing is we have virtual advertising in our, in our stadium, which means if, if you watch a football game, 
um, you see the banners on the um, on the um, uh, those those boards on the game uh, around the around the pitch, and we have a technique where we kind of overlay those uh, boards where our partners in China can communicate very locally to their audience in China with Chinese um, letters. But if you watch it in Germany, you you see a German um, commercials. So this is a technique where our uh, partners can still communicate with the fans that they need to reach digitally, that they um, could have done it when they were in, a, in the stadium, but also um, now through rather digital ways. Okay, great. Um, another question is, um, obviously you're aware that the, the timetable was that this summer, uh, Borussia Dortmund was planning to go on an Asian tour. And so the amount of money that was invested from sponsors um, what happens now to your compensation for the sponsors? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good point because that um, was a huge project. As you mentioned, especially for our international sponsors, um, those summer tours are super important. This is a time where, where the team travels to those countries where they're close to the fans, to the media, and to the partners. So they spend a lot of money to it, and this is quite a big part of their contracts. So we had to think about a way how we can, yeah, how we, make, how, we, how we can make up for it. And so we came up with this virtual Asia tour, um, which hasn't been done uh, before by any other club in, in, in Europe. I don't know about any clubs uh, in the US who have done a, a virtual tour. So we try to tick all those boxes. Uh, we try to be close with our fans, with our partners, and with our with media through um, virtual activities and what that meant at the end of the day is we combined streams from Dortmund to physical events in for example China where COVID allowed to have physical events so um, to give a, an example we would have um, at the Dortmund team practice or have a friendly game in Dortmund we would rearrange the training ground with Chinese um, logos and uh, partners on the boards because they paid for it. We would stream it to China on, on Weibo, on WeChat, yeah. have a Chinese moderator. So it's tailor-made for China. It's in Chinese language. They can, uh, they can watch it. We, have, we had a, a show before the game, halftime show, where we produced again with our players in Dortmund content for our Chinese fans. So um, then millions of people dialed in, watched those friendly matches that were just for Chinese. So we reached even more people through this virtual friendly match, basically, than we would have done through a physical match. And this is kind of what we did um, with all the other, we, we had uh, press con virtual press conferences with our media broadcasters in Asia. We had uh, meet and greets with players, um, with our fan clubs in, in China, in Singapore, in Japan. Um, Again, we produced a lot of content for our social media channels in those countries. So we never left Dortmund. Our team stayed in Dortmund, was able to practice for their season. But uh, because we streamed it and combined it with events in China, in Japan, uh, we kind of created this virtual tour and um, yeah, had great numbers. Um, the feedback was, was, was amazing. We didn't have to transfer any money back. That was the ultimate goal. Um, they were all happy with this tour and what I mentioned earlier is this is a new, due to COVID, this is a new right that we developed that we can now make use of um, in the future as well. So during the winter break when usually our club doesn't go to the US or to Asia, this could be something we could do every year in winter, virtually fly to, to those markets and in summer physically. Uh, go to US or go go to Asia. So um, that was yeah one of those rights that we compensated. Okay, I have a, a question from one of our sports law faculty members. Um, how has COVID impacted your drafting interpretation of force majeure provisions in your contracts? Can you maybe paraphr paraphrase that again? <laughs> I just uh, I don't want to. Okay, no, 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 you're fine. But give the wrong answer. How, how did it impact um, yeah, signing force, you? Yeah, force majeure provisions are, are um, you know, natural disasters, pandemics. How does that? Oh, impact? okay, never mind. We actually, 
we did have this clause in, I think, two or three uh, contracts uh, where it, it said, um, I think, like with events out of our hand, out of our control, natural disasters, um, then uh, we don't have to cover for those rights. However, so and this was, for example, with Puma, and this is a big deal, a uh, big contract, one of the biggest one, it's our third biggest uh, sponsor. So technically we could have gotten out of it, but in, in reality, they are partners for seven or eight years and they, we want to stay, maintain this partnership for the next 10 years. So we didn't say, okay, um, we're not gonna cover for your 70 tickets every match day for your 20 PR appearances uh, with players, etc. So we still compensated them, try to make everything work um, and didn't make use of this clause which I think in the long run will, will help us a lot. Okay, great, great. Um, one more question on this topic before we pivot to other topics. Um, from one of our undergraduate students, Aggie Dent, um, what is one trend in sports that you have seen as a result of COVID but you think will become permanent post-COVID? I think it, it depends on the league, but in Germany in particular, I think one of the trends that is not very new due to COVID, but um, just strengthened the, the approach that we always have is focus on our youth talent because um, we're very limited to, to financial um, revenue streams and more limited than other leagues. Um, EPL, they have investors, etc. cetera. Um, Germany, um, we have this rule, I don't want to go into too much detail, but we have a rule, it's called 50 plus one rule. So all the clubs are owned by its fans. We don't have those franchises that you have in the US. We don't have private investors that can just give us millions of, of euros um, to, for new um, players. So we need to focus on talents and BVB does this very well. Um, talking about Haaland, Sancho, Reina, um, Great talent, 17 years old, uh, it's now starting for Dortmund, um, US talent. So I think this is a trend that will only, only strengthen in, in the next few months or in the next few years. Um, another trend where I think Germany was always lacking is, is digital. Um, digital activations, um, just be more present, uh, omnipresent throughout the world. I think the EPL does an amazing job when it comes to marketing. Um, so I think this kind of more, even more opened our eyes that we um, need to find ways to, to stay connected with our global fan base and just not be true to focus on the German market. Um, I think those are the, the two trends, not very new, but COVID just proved us um, right that we still need to focus on that, I think. Oh, it's good to have the focus. Um, switching gears a bit, I have another question from, um, from Dr. Lee Eagle, who's one of our full-time faculty members. Um, how have community and social responsibility efforts been affected? Um, so the community, that was uh, yeah, quite a, a topic that was hard to foresee because in the beginning, shut down um, and the, the public demanded uh, like no extra treatment for the football millionaires. They shouldn't play football. Although Germany, it's just football is the number one sports. We don't have like, like you guys, we don't have four or five sports. It's all about football. So whole Germany watches on Saturday and Sunday, watches only football. But nevertheless, uh, because although nobody was able to do anything, it was locked down. They still didn't want the Bundesliga to restart or many people because they said, look, like, we don't, like, this is something everybody has to face and everybody should um, stay as safe as possible. We don't want Bundesliga teams not to travel to have fans in the stadium. So um, that was something that I didn't expect to that extent. Um, so we did a lot uh, when it comes to corporate social res responsibility. So for example, Dortmund uh, had kind of this fund where for our local bars around the match day, um, we, our, our fans were able, when it did restart, where they could buy virtually basically a beer from that bar. So kind of donate to the bars that they would like to go during a match day around the stadium. So we helped a lot of bars uh, in the area of the stadium to, to survive because our fans kind of still had their beer in those bars 
um, by donating it. So we did help a lot in our local communities, um, or especially when it comes to restaurants, bars, etc., breweries. Okay, great. So I have another question from a professor in our program, uh, David Cooper. Uh, do you anticipate sports betting will increase or decrease with fewer live games with fans? Very difficult question. Um, <laughs> I know, I know for a fact because I'm uh, yeah looking after our international sponsors. Internationally, it increases, um, especially in the Chinese market, where it's even a little bit forbidden. Uh, the slippery slope, um, but it's increasing internationally for sure. Germany, if you look at every team, almost every team has a betting partner. Um, Dortmund as well. So it, it is omnipresent, but I think nevertheless, people don't really, not necessarily trust it that much, I think. Uh, it's, I guess it's good money that every club takes, happily takes, but it's uh, not as popular as I think it is in other, um, in other countries, um, where it's just um, it's part of society, I guess. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're going to transition back to questions about uh, the club. Okay, so with the impact of the pandemic and the possibilities that this could continue to impact how sports are watched, from a partnership perspective, is BVB focusing on partnering with companies that could thrive in the COVID impacted world in the future? Uh, companies such as VR, AR, technology, healthcare, streaming, and other industries that are actually prospering from the situation and can reach consumers' homes better than other companies pre-COVID? This is a fantastic question by Sebastian Milo. Yeah, it's a great question. I, um, my answer would be yes and no. Yes, we, we did just start an e-football team. Um, and so we don't want to call it e-sports because we don't want to go into uh, League of Legends, Dota, um, um, et cetera. So we want to still focus on, on football. So, um, but we do now have a, have a virtual a team where we use our, we have a, now a switch, a Twitch uh, channel where we're very present, where we have not only professional e-football players or FIFA players, but also content creators, et cetera. Cause we noticed in Twitch, um, this is the, uh, the channel where the next, uh, the, the next generation of fans are. Um, so this is a huge market where we haven't been before and where we focus on now. Um, I think also due to COVID, because um, we just started it, I think, two months ago. So, yes, we are looking in those, into those companies and also that comes along with partnerships. When we go into eFootball, especially in Asia, uh, then we, are, we do acquire new partners because of eFootball. No, because our focus lays on maintaining our, our partners. Um, we want to keep them happy, make them happy, and at the end of the day, sell them up, elevate the partnerships, because it's easier, it's, I think it's cheaper, uh, less resources, and to, to, to increase the volume of a contract, of a package, than to acquire new partners. So our main focus is just keep our partners that, are, that have been loyal, um, help them throughout the situation, they are helping us, and then ideally sell them up, and then secondarily, we are looking into new partners. Um, and then those new partners then would be those uh, companies that uh, were just mentioned. Um, that's exactly the, the niche that we're looking for, um, after. Okay. I'm going to give you a, an out just in case um, this is proprietary information. Um, you mentioned that Dortmund's marketing and sponsorship operations are focused on China and, and Asia. Um, alongside China and Asia, where do you see the next market or area for Dortmund to get into? Um, yeah, so it's, it's China and Southeast Asia for sure, but the next market we're trying to, um, to win over is India. Um, and um, Puma is also um, quite, quite big there, so we work with them on new techniques and new, new ways to, uh, to be more present there. Um, and I think we, we do a great job. Some, there are just a few bigger clubs that are actually trying to win over this market, some EPL teams. But um, so I think this is the, the market we are focusing on now, besides uh, China and, and Southeast Asia. So that's the, the next market we're trying to win. 
USA, obviously a huge market, uh, super sports enthusiastic, but the competition is just super big. You have those five sports, basically, um, EPL, yeah, also just because of the language, I guess, uh, another reason um, why the EPL is just much, much bigger in the US. So yes, I think in two years we will go to the US uh, for, as a summer tour, next year Asia, in two years uh, US. But um, the next market that we are trying to win is, is India. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned earlier about um, the compensation for sponsors. Um, do you have enough leeway from your leadership at Dortmund to satisfy clients? Um, or do you need to get prior authorization for that plan you had for engaging with China? Um, not really. I got to say I'm, I'm fortunate that my, my, my boss, my manager trusts us a lot. So we all, basically we're all on our own bosses. We all have our portfolio of partners. I have all the international ones, then the other have the, the national ones. And um, obviously when it comes to negotiating and to, to tell them, okay, look, I want to um, sell them this new right for X amount of money. I, I talk to my, uh, to, to the leadership and, um, Kind of get their approval or more it's more or less uh, their experience what they would say because this is new to everyone so it's just a, a constant exchange of of, um, of of opinions basically to just brainstorm how to monetize um, those rights but i think in general um it's it's up to up to me i guess um how to how to compensate and how to go into those um uh, conversations because i know my sponsors best better than any other colleague because I'm communicating with them on a daily basis. So um, I can better evaluate how the situation is, how much I can ask for, et cetera. Okay, great, great. Um, the next question has to do with um, social justice. So I'm not sure if you're aware, but social justice in the US was a hot button topic during the spring and summer. Um, do you deal with those types of social justice situations in your position at Dortmund? Um, For instance, we have the Black Lives Matter movement. There's the um, the, the NBA had the issues with um, Hong Kong and China when mm -hmm. Daryl Morey yeah. sent a tweet. So, so those types of situations, do you, yeah. maybe not so much new, you, but do you in your role have any kind of interaction with social justice issues? I mean, not really. I mean, uh, it's obviously we were aware of it and follow it um, quite intensely what's going on in the US. And I, um, our, some of our players also, when they celebrated, they had a shirt with Black Lives Matter. Um, we had a um, training ground or before a game where um, they hold on posters, etc. So Black Lives Matter was, was a big topic um, in the summer. Personally, um, I wasn't really involved into any, any parts of it. Um, wasn't was never a topic with my partners. I didn't have any partners where we talked about how, how, how to tackle this, this challenge. I think it's very sensitive. We are, we are far away from, from what's going on in the US. Obviously we follow it, um, but it was never a personal topic for myself besides following it in the news and seeing some players sending their, their messages. Um, yeah. Okay, no, great, great. Um, next question is about the Bundesliga was probably the first league, especially soccer league, to return to play post-COVID. Um, will the return of fans, um, do, do you think that your efforts in improving throughout that time period and coming back without fans, will the return to fans negatively impact your success next season? Um, yes, I mean, we, so now it's match day four. Um, and the first three matches, we already had, I think, 11,000. It depends on um, the capacity of your stadium. So we were, Dortmund having the biggest stadium, uh, we were allowed to have 11,000 fans in the stadium, the last two home matches. Um, and which, which was very surprising when I saw your slides. Um, in Germany, uh, the fans, the partners, uh, the, the phones didn't stop uh, ringing. Everybody wanted to be part of uh, the game. So we were sold out. And um, it was very difficult decision to make who to invite to those games. Because if you just say those VIP or sponsors, then our fans would say, oh, again, like, uh, 
the hardcore fans should get the um, should get the tickets and not uh, the rich sponsors, to put it in their words. So it was a very sensitive topic who to invite. Everybody wanted tickets. We were very happy because, um, I mean, it still didn't cover not a bit uh, like um, of of the cost that a uh, that a stadium that usually has eighty one thousand uh, fans every match. So those losses, uh, those financial losses, are, are dramatic. But um, we had a different situation than than we had in the U.S. But because numbers are increasing in Germany again, we we can't really plan. I I assume that next weekend we won't have any fans in the stadium. Um, so we are dependent on the politicians. And um, last time they made a call that uh, on Thursday and for some other clubs, even on Friday night, that fans were allowed. So then Friday night, um, talking to the sponsors, to the fans all night, even Saturday morning, who can come, personalized tickets. So um, it was crazy. Um, so, and I don't expect it to change a bit because we have no clarity who can come, how many people can come. And those decisions are usually made one or two days before a match day. So those days are, are crazy right before home match. All right, great. Okay, so we have time for two more questions. Um, the first one, after the Champions League uh, title in 2012-2013, in um, that's when Borussia Dortmund, I guess, entered the international stage. Um, of course, you being a lifelong fan, they've always been a big deal. Um, what are your thoughts on Borussia Dortmund having a presence in the U.S., similar to other clubs like FC Barcelona, Bayern, et cetera? I think um, we, Dortmund is quite a unique selling point. Um, we have always strong talents, um, which other teams in the EPL don't necessarily have. They, they have the money to, um, to buy already experienced superstars. We don't really have that. So I think... That's something that's very exciting about Dortmund. Um, also very different to Bayern Munich, who are dominating um, every year the league. And it's, it's diff very difficult to, to uh, compete with them. Um, but I think in the US, there is definitely a, a market um, for, for Dortmund. We always, in the recent uh, past, we always had uh, US players. I mean, Christian Pulisic came, came to Dortmund with his father when he was, I think, 15. Um, now we have uh, Reina, who is yeah, maybe the next superstar, the next Christian Pulisic, um, again, starting, starting at BVB and from before Marco Reus. <laughs> so I think, um, I think we do have quite some fans in, in the US. Uh, we have a couple of fan clubs. We have some youth academies over there. Um, so we are present. But obviously, we can't really compare with the Barcelona, with Real Madrid, with Manchester United. It's a long way, but um, we're different to those clubs. And I think that makes it easier. We have a different story to tell, also with the stadium, with the fans. That's, yeah, open some doors. No, no, thank you. Thank you. We definitely appreciate the, the candor, the, the insider's perspective for BBB and Dortmund. Um, we do have one more question, if you have time. Um, mm -hmm. This is from our... Uh, sports law professor, Cameron Myler. <laughs> um, IOC Olympic Charter Rule 50 prohibits political demonstrations in the venues at the Olympic Games. Uh, this rule is being actively debated now. Are there similar rules that apply to Dortmund players about their conduct on the football pitch? There's, yeah, there's a similar rule. I don't know how it's called, but basically we shouldn't be, we shouldn't send any political messages. Um, we should separate sports and politics. So, and you players do get fines for it, but it strongly depends on the circumstances. So I'm just mentioned uh, quite a few BVB players um, showed their support for Black Lives Matters. And um, the rule states that they, they're not allowed to do it, but they didn't get fined. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a very thin line. Um, I think um, as a lawyer, um, it's, uh, there are some loopholes, um, but I, it's, it's, it's a law that, that's been stretched, I feel like, every year. And it really depends on, on the circumstances, um, which I don't know if that's, if that's good or not, but uh, there's not a very strict rule, I guess. 
No, no, no. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Hans. Thank you for the great words. Um, thank you for everyone out there joining us for this iteration of the Chalk Talk series. Um, we're excited to bring you original content on a weekly basis, especially during the fall 2020 semester. Um, please check us out again on, on YouTube. S subscribe to our channel at the Preston Robert Tisch Institute for Global Sport. Um, take care and have a good evening. Perfect. Right. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I hope I answered some of the questions uh, <laughs> the way you wanted it. And yeah, thank you very much for having me and have a great evening. All right. Take care. You, you as well. Bye-bye.